So a polar bear from Canada told a black bear from America to stay on your side, eh? <laughs> the black bear said, it's cool, we're all in the same family. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Got one more for you. So, me and my wife, we were having a little fight at home, and I know what you're thinking. A domestic? Us? That's a little sus, but what am I to do? She's the one who's acting like a pig all the time. <laughs> It's estimated that our planet currently has over 10 million different species of organisms, with us humans only counting as one on that vast list. An interesting and important concept to understand when looking at all of these organisms is that no two organisms are the same. Variation exists between all of these organisms, whether we are comparing a bacteria to an oak tree or two identical twins with each other, there could be a lot of variation or a little, but the variation will be there. These variation patterns can be very complex and are the basis for how organisms are named and classified by humans. There is such a vast amount of biodiversity on our planet, and for scientists and other people who seek to understand and classify every living thing they come across, it can be a difficult task to try to sift through the variation and make sense of it all. Today, we have a system that scientists around the world use to classify organisms, but that was not always the case. In the 18th century, a professor named Carlos Linnaeus had an idea to create a universal system to name organisms. This came about from his travels and attempts to understand plants. Everywhere he went, each scientist had a different way of classifying plants. This made it extremely confusing to try and put two different names of the same species of plant together. So, Linnaeus created a system for naming any organism, whether it be a plant or animal, using a unique Latin Greek system. He based these names solely on the physical features of the plant or animal, which he called morphological classification. So if two different species had similar physical traits, their names could be similar, but never the exact same, obviously, so one could tell the two species apart. This work was published in 1735 and was the basis for the system that we still use today. Let's talk about how this works. The system that Linnaeus created, which is the system that we still use, is called the binomial nomenclature system. This system requires each individual species to have a two-part name with very distinct formatting that also classifies their relation to other organisms. A name written in scientific nomenclature, which uses this binomial system, is created by the genus name and the species name of the organism. The first letter of the genus name is always capitalized, while all letters of the species name are lowercase. If it is being typed, all letters must be italicized, and if it is being written, all letters must be underlined. You must use this formatting during all formal IB examinations when specifically asked, including on the IA. Panthera Leo is the scientific name for the African lion. Which version do you think is written correctly? If you picked B, you got it right. It's important to note that the genus name can indicate that two different species are closely related. So for example, we have Panthera Leo and Panthera pardus, which is a leopard, shares a close lineage and many physical features with Panthera leo, which is why they both share the same genus name, Panthera. Now Linnaeus classified species by their morphology, but as time went on it was clear that only classifying species this way was problematic. A new idea was created to define the term species, which we call the biological species concept. This concept defines species as organisms that can breed together and produce fertile offspring, which means their offspring can then go on to breed as well. Organisms that cannot breed with one another, or can breed with one another but not produce fertile offspring, would have to be classified as different species. While this is a good definition, there are still a few problems with it when considering all organisms that are found on our planet. And if you were to ask different scientists to define the term species, they might give you slightly different answers. 
This conversation about how to define what a species is continues as we find new ways to compare organisms. It started with morphology, then moved to reproduction, and now we can look at DNA along with other molecular data and fossil records. For the IB exam, you need to know the biological species concept definition along with a few ideas that can challenge it. Drawing the line between two organisms that are or are not the same species can be difficult because the process of deriving new species, with how we define them, is a slow and gradual process. And this process of starting with one population described as one species and having it diverge into two populations of two different species is called speciation. Let's go through a common example of how speciation occurs using the Galapagos Island finches. The Galapagos Islands are located 1,000 kilometers off the coast of Ecuador, and today is home to many different species of animals, including finches. It is estimated that around 2 million years ago, an ancestor to the finch landed on the islands. They inhabited different islands that had different environmental factors and food sources. Over time, through natural selection, they adopted to their localized island and were isolated from each other. Some islands had food sources consisting of large shelled nuts and seeds, which favored birds with large blunt beaks. Other islands had cactus flowers, which favored birds that had long, thin beaks to extract food from the cactus flower without being harmed. Over very long periods of time, and many generations, with different selective pressures and the isolation of each island, the original ancestral species diverged into many new species that no longer breed with each other and have drastically different traits. So yes, we can say that there are different species of finches here. But at what point could we call them different species? After 1 million years of adapting, 500,000 years of adapting, how many different traits must they have for us to be sure? Because the process of change in this example is slow and gradual, to pinpoint the exact moment that the divergence took place is difficult and up for interpretation. At this point, we know that different species of organisms are different in morphology and also in reproductive capabilities. The variation between species can be studied at other levels, and some of these you need to know for the IB exam. First off, organisms show diversity between chromosome numbers when comparing one species to another. The example that you need to know is comparing humans to chimpanzees. Obviously, humans and chimpanzees are different species. And when we look into their diploid cells, which contain two sets of all chromosomes, always making the total number an even number, you can see that the humans have a total of 46 chromosomes and the chimpanzees have a total of 48. This is another key indicator of them being different species, as all organisms of the same species should have the same number of chromosomes. To continue to compare a few more examples, we can see that dogs have a total of 78 chromosomes in their diploid cells and rice plants have a total of 24 in their diploid cells. This again shows how different numbers of chromosomes are a characteristic of individual species. Let's dive a bit deeper into chromosomes to show a bit more about how organisms are diverse. Information about chromosomes can be determined by creating a karyogram, which is a picture of the chromosomes of an organism lined up generally by size. So the first chromosome is the largest and the next chromosomes will get smaller and smaller. Remember that diploid cells have two copies of each chromosome, which we can see here on this karyogram. And if we count this up based on the number and shapes of these chromosomes, we should be able to deduce that these are from a human diploid cell. Taking a closer look, we can identify more information about these structures. First, we can see that each chromosome contains a centromere in a different location. This is where the two sister chromatids connect and tend to give each chromosome a different shape. Some chromosomes have the centromere closer to the center, which we call metacentric chromosomes, while others have the centromere located away from the center and are called acrocentric, having a larger portion of the chromosome on one side of the centromere and a smaller portion on the other. In either case, the sections of DNA on either side of the centromere are called arms. The longer arm is the Q arm, and the shorter one is the P arm. Chromosomes contain wrapped up DNA and when they are intentionally stained, banding patterns appear which help indicate which chromosome it is, which helps the process of ordering them for a karyogram and helps identify any abnormalities for research or health purposes. 
Now we can use images like karyograms to compare diversity between organisms and potentially evaluate hypotheses for how changes have happened over time. Take humans and chimpanzees. Humans have a total of 46 chromosomes and chimpanzees have 48. Now we know that humans and chimpanzees shared a very recent common ancestor, so the question is, how did this shift in chromosome numbers take place? What happened to our chromosome number to make it one less, or two less in a diploid cell? Two hypotheses can explain this. Either one chromosome completely disappeared, or two chromosomes fused together to become one. It's more likely that the chromosomes fused together, because completely eliminating that much DNA could have dire consequences. But can we test this? Is there any data we can use to try to support this hypothesis? Looking at the shapes and banding patterns between the karyotypes of both organisms, it is hypothesized that human chromosome number 2 was derived from a fusion of the ancestral chromosomes of what chimpanzees currently have as chromosomes 2a and 2b, also called 2p and 2q. This is supported by the evidence of the shapes and banding patterns of the chromosomes. Organisms of the same species share many qualities, but they are not exactly the same. An organism's genome describes all of the genetic information, or DNA code, that they have. And if we compare two organisms of the same species, like humans, we can see that the vast majority of their genome is the same, especially when compared to other organisms of different species. But diversity still exists. We as humans all share the same genes, which is why our DNA is extremely similar, with over 99% of our bases being exactly the same. But what about that fraction of a percent? That accounts for a few million DNA bases we have that differ from other humans. We do have the same genes, but different alleles of each gene causes variation, and this comes from small differences in the DNA sequence. This can start with a single, random change in the DNA sequence via a mutation. Most of the time these mutations, or DNA changes, are not harmful, and are simply passed down to the next generation. Some of them can be harmful if they negatively impact the creation of an important protein, in which we would then call this a genetic disorder. We call this change in the DNA a single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP for short. And this is why none of us are exactly the same. You might have a guanine at a specific position in your DNA where your best friend has an adenine. Much of this information was figured out from the Human Genome Project, where in 1990 a group of scientists all over the world mapped out every single gene within the human genome. With this base information, we can compare your DNA to another person, and can deduce some important information about your ancestry and if you have a genetic predisposition or disorder. To further illustrate this point, we can use this DNA sequencing image. Each color represents a different DNA base, and you will notice that the dad of the child and the uncle are twins, presumably identical. But there is one small change at this location, where one twin has a blue band, the other twin, and that twin's son, have a red band. This single nucleotide polymorphism created variation between the two twins, who are supposed to have exactly the same DNA and we can use sequencing methods like this one to prove it. Genomic information can also be used to differentiate organisms based on size and sequence order. Let's talk about how this works. First, the base sequence of DNA, and the genes for that matter, differ more between organisms of different species than between organisms of the same species. This is because organisms of the same species have the same genes, and when you compare organisms of different species, different genes are present. A great example of this would be comparing humans to geranium. Geranium is a type of flowering plant, which uses photosynthesis to create sugar molecules that the plant can use. In order for this to work, the plant has specific genes within its cells to build structures called chloroplasts. We as humans do not have these genes, and therefore do not build chloroplasts within our cells. So the greater the difference in the DNA base sequence, the easier it is to distinguish if organisms are different species. In addition to the sequence itself, the amount of bases, or size of the genome, can differ greatly between organisms of different species. An easy example of this is comparing humans to Drosophila melanogaster, common name fruit fly. With our entire genome, humans have about 3.2 billion base pairs that make up our DNA, where fruit flies have about 180 million. Due to this drastic difference, it is easy to tell that humans and fruit flies are different species. For the IB exam, you need to know that organisms of different species have different genome sizes. And in addition to that, you also need to be able to compare them. This comparison can be achieved through database technology that contains genome sequencing DNA 
from different species. Let's use the National Center for Biotechnology Information website to run some comparisons. You can get to the site by going to this link. Let's explore together in real time. Genome sequencing is a big deal in the realm of biology because it allows scientists to compare organisms and see how closely related they are. Upon creating comparisons, scientists can put together diagrams like this, which is called a cladogram. It shows how closely related each organism is to the other, with branching points representing common ancestry. So the closer they are, the more recently they shared a common ancestor, and therefore the more closely related they are. We'll talk about this in more detail in another video. Sequencing genomic data today is much easier than it was even five years ago, so much so that people like me have chosen to send their DNA to a lab to get sequenced. This can tell you some interesting information about your ancestry when compared to large amounts of other human DNA sequences and genetic markers for your health. While this advancement in technology is amazing and can likely provide great benefits, especially when creating a personal health profile for someone, there are some who question its use. Like all other types of data, it has the potential to be stolen and used in a negative way, like discriminating against people with certain genetic diseases. Certain privacy laws have been created in some countries to protect people from this. For better or worse, DNA sequencing and genome comparisons are here to stay and can be used on any living organism.